So here we are, folks. It is the fifth Sunday in Lent. At last, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified, according to John's Gospel. This is John's special language for telling us that Jesus is about to die. Indeed, this is Jesus' last public appearance until he is arrested and undergoes trial and is crucified, raised from the dead, and ascends to heaven in John's account. So, why has the hour come now? Why has the hour come now? It kind of seems like a dramatic response to a few Greeks just wanting to see Jesus. We know that tensions and hostilities have been escalating between Jesus and the temple leaders for quite some time in John's Gospel. When Jesus raises Lazarus from the tomb, that is just the final straw. The religious authorities are enraged, plotting to put Jesus to death. And despite being a wanted man, Jesus re-enters Jerusalem for the Passover feast, greeted by cheering crowds, witnessing the crowd's elated frenzy over Jesus. Rather than seizing him immediately, the leaders throw up their hands and say, You see, you can do nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Remember that world? That world God so loves that Charlie preached so beautifully about last week? Immediately following this, these Greeks, these random Greeks, Considered foreigners, God-fearing Gentiles, they come to the disciples and they ask, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. As one commentator puts it, these Greeks are the scouting party representing the whole world who want to see Jesus, who want to know Jesus, who want to be in relationship with Jesus. This is the catalyst that leads Jesus to announce the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Jesus will grant the world their wish by fully revealing God's love for the world for all to see. He says, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. For John, Jesus' crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension are not linear events, but simultaneous, one fluid, glorious lifting up and outpouring of God's sacrificial love given to the world. And yet... Jesus' death is an inescapable part of his lifting up and drawing the whole world to him. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. So the question posed by the gospel at this juncture in our, our Lenten journey is, do we like these Greeks, still wish to see Jesus if he must die? Or would we rather turn away and get on with our lives? Knowing the violence and vulnerability, the cost, pain, and sacrifice involved, are we drawn toward Jesus or drawn away from Jesus at this hour? Now, I I suspect we are conflicted. Such is our human spiritual experience. On one hand, we all wish to see Jesus, don't we? We are all drawn towards this good shepherd who desires to gather us in so we may have life and have it abundantly. I have this postcard on my desk at home that says, God is gathering you in. Rest in that truth. Who doesn't want to feel comforted by this divine hug, secure in this sense of true belonging to God? 
So then why are we drawn away from Jesus so easily? Jesus says, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out as a result of his lifting up and gathering all people to himself. An alternative and more helpful translation for me for judgment is crisis. Now is the crisis of this world. Oh, well, you can say that again. We've got a global climate crisis. Our democracy is in crisis. There's a border crisis, a gun violence crisis, a poverty crisis, a crisis in the Middle East and Ukraine, and the list goes on and on. And against this backdrop, we must also contend with our own personal crises or that of our loved ones related to health, finances, loss, and relationships. Such crises draw us away from Jesus in a heartbeat. When we're in crisis, we tend to get swept away by the swift and varied changes of the world as if that is all there is. In our impulsive reactions, we are prone to be governed by our unruly wills and affections rather than by Jesus' way of love. In short, we want to be rulers of our world. We want to be in control. We want to fix the world's problems on our own, DIY style. Leave me alone, Jesus, I got this. When we are convinced that only we alone can manage and solve the crises in our lives and society, we can't see Jesus. We can't even remember Jesus exists. We have no space to be drawn toward Jesus. Instead, we are driven out and away from God, neighbor, and creation. Our lives contract, become small, and we become hostages of an isolated, finite existence driven by anxiety and the need to survive. Falling prey to the rulers of the world around us, offering easy, convenient answers and assurances. Simple, excuse me, single grains stored in the cupboard, never planted, remaining single grains. The good news is that Jesus shows us the way of so daily dying to the way of self, so daily living to the way of love as we sang in our hymn earlier. He says, those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Okay, now, yuck. I find that translation really alienating and it kind of makes me shut down. <laughs> So let's try this one from the message, because this is a really important, important piece. Anyone who holds on to life just as it is destroys that life. But if you let it go, reckless in your love, you'll have it forever, real and eternal. Anyone who holds on to life just as it is destroys that life. But if you let it go, reckless in your love, you'll have it forever, real and eternal. If we want to live, we must stop being crisis junkies, deluded by our own self-sufficiency and attachment to the status quo. Instead, we are called to be Jesus junkies. Now, this doesn't mean we turn away from the world's crises. Instead, we're called to surrender our unruly wills, letting the rulers within be driven out so that we are free to be drawn toward the outstretched arms of Jesus, dying, rising, and gathering all created reality into the glorious dwelling place of God's heart. Only in being drawn toward Jesus into the heart of God can we be free to be drawn out into our communities, 
to love and to serve as healers and helpers, freeing others from the corrupt rulers and oppressive powers of this world. Jesus junkies let go of life ruled by our wills and that of the world's to be reckless in love, trusting the abundant life God intends for the world she so loves. So, Jesus junkies, how are you being drawn closer toward Jesus on your Lenten journey? For me, it starts with simply focusing on my breath, being still, pausing to remember Jesus is already within, written on my heart. And I feel drawn by, I feel drawn toward Jesus by the beauty of spring wildflowers while I am hiking with my dogs. When I'm listening to our Emmaus guests tell me stories of struggle, pain, and hope, witnessing my sacred ground group reflect on the scourge of racism and figuring out how we can heal from it, joining with thousands of people of faith at the annual risk Nehemiah action to demand justice for the Richmond community, and gathered with you, St. Paul's, around book, font, and table every Sunday to worship and praise God. There's a beautiful collect we used to pray together at seminary every morning at morning prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, you stretched out your arms of love on the hard wood of the cross that everyone, everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. My prayer and hope is that none of us ever feels beyond the reach of Jesus' love amidst all the swift and varied changes of life. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified, and in the face of seemingly insurmountable crises and despotic rulers of this world, may we be given the grace to be drawn closer into the broken, beautiful body of Jesus as he is lifted up on the cross, lifted to new life, lifted into God's heart, our true home, so that we might draw others into this love without end. God is gathering you in. Rest in that truth.